Continuation of Chapter 8 The Liberal Mentality, Perpetual Incoherence Religious liberty was condemned by Pope Gregory XVI, by Pope Pius IX, and by all the popes until Vatican II. With whom must we side? Must we disobey the popes prior to the council? Must we now obey the current pope? It is impossible to accept the contrary of what the magisterium of the Church always taught before the Council. Ah, Pope Paul VI said to me, there isn't time now to discuss theological questions. We completely, totally, and absolutely obey all the popes who taught prior to Vatican II, when the liberalism they condemned infiltrated the Church. Even now, the Pope is troubled by the liberalism from which he has not been able to disentangle himself. The liberals are in a state of constant contradiction, incoherence, hesitation. In his latest directives, the Pope made reprimands. He significantly reaffirmed that it is necessary to make an act of adoration before receiving Holy Communion. This is exactly what we require. Not only do we require it, we do it. Whereas in all the ceremonies since the Council, there is no act of adoration. People come forward to receive Holy Communion in the hand or on the tongue, but there is no act of adoration. If the Pope does not use sanctions, his words remain a dead letter. If in practice he lacks the firmness he displays on paper, he is acting in a typically liberal manner. We fight liberalism. We are anti-liberals. It is against liberalism that we fight, for it is corrupting and destroying the Church. We refuse it and we maintain that we are perfectly obedient to the Church, and in a certain measure obedient to what the Pope would desire. It is because he hasn't the courage or the strength to fight against them, because he is a liberal. We are with him to the extent that he is anti-liberal, that he himself desires to combat the liberalism in the Church, it can be hoped that one day Rome will count on us and find in our work a support in order to return to what the popes prior to the Council have always demanded. It is impossible to read the encyclicals of these popes, like that of Gregory the Sixteenth, and be in agreement with what is being done today and which has always been condemned. How many times have I heard bishops say that, realistically, it is impossible to express the faith today as it was expressed 100 years ago or at the time of the Council of Trent? Their language completely contradicts what Gregory XVI affirms. Is it necessary, then, to side with Gregory XVI and all the popes who have expressed with equal vigor the irreformability of Catholic doctrine and have denounced all the evils that menace it, popes like Pius IX, Leo XIII, and Pope St. Pius X? Or must we side with those who want to change the expression of our faith? To change the formulation of the faith is to change the faith. Unfortunately, we observe this today. Indifferentism, death of the missionary spirit. One of the main themes Gregory the Sixteenth stresses is indifferentism. Quote, we now come to another and most fruitful cause of the evils which at present afflict the church and which we so bitterly deplore. We mean indifferentism, 
or that fatal opinion everywhere diffused by the craft of the wicked, that men can, by the profession of any faith, obtain the eternal salvation of their souls, provided their life conforms to justice and probity. But in a question so clear and evident, it will undoubtedly be easy for us to pluck up from amid the people confided to your care so pernicious an error. The Apostle warns us of it. One God, one faith, one baptism. Let them tremble, then, who imagine that every creed leads by an easy path to the port of felicity, and reflect seriously on the testimony of our Savior himself, that those are against Christ who are not with Christ. End quote. This condemns all the schemas, all the documents concerning the non-Christian religions elaborated during the Council. Reading them, one would think that all the religions are means of salvation, which is unthinkable. It is truly indifferentism. Ever since then, one speaks of, quote, the three monotheistic religions. But the Jewish and Islamic religions are against Christ because they are not with him. It is clear. How is it possible to use such an expression as the three monotheistic religions? We are with Christ, our God. The others are against him. The Jews are manifestly against Christ. The Muslims are also against him, that is also clear. They say that we are idolaters because we adore a man, Jesus Christ, whereas they only adore one God. If they are against Christ, they are not with our Lord, and so they cannot be with God. One could cite the words of St. John, Whosoever denieth the Son the same hath not the Father. He that confesseth the Son hath the Father also. 1 John 2.23 Yet, we read in Nostra Etate, the declaration on the relation of the Church to non-Christian religions, quote, The Church has also a high regard for the Muslims. They worship God, who is one, living and subsistent, merciful and almighty. The Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. End quote. Such affirmations completely destroy the missionary spirit. What could missionaries who are convinced by these conciliar documents on the relations of the Church with non-Christian religions possibly think, if not, what am I doing here if it is possible for people to be saved in all the religions, provided that they be good? I needlessly disturb consciences. On the contrary, if one is convinced that there is no salvation outside the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, then one would ardently desire to be everywhere at once in order to cry out, For heaven's sake! Believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. The missionary spirit consumes the soul of priests and pushes them to travel throughout the world to go and preach the gospel, to preach our Lord and convince the adepts of false religions to be converted to the one true religion. What happened at the occasion of the council was overwhelming. Freedom of conscience, freedom of error. Gregory the Sixteenth develops the theme. Quote, From this poisoned source of indifferentism flows that false and absurd, or rather extravagant, maxim that liberty of conscience should be established and guaranteed to each man, a most contagious error to which that absolute and unbridled liberty of opinion, which for the ruin of church and state spreads over the world, and which some men, by unbridled impudence, 
fear not to represent as advantageous to the church. And what more certain death for souls, says St. Augustine, than the liberty of error? End quote. The phrase, liberty of conscience, must be correctly understood, of course, for we also demand liberty of conscience so that no one can force our consciences to adopt error. We demand not to be tortured, as were the martyrs, in order to force them to adore idols. For us, liberty of conscience means the freedom of the soul to adhere to the truth. But, when freedom of conscience is taken to mean that everyone is entitled to his own morality and his own faith, that he can do as he pleases and believe what he wants, this is unacceptable. A Muslim will say, For us, polygamy is normal. My conscience tells me that polygamy is good. You say that it is not so, but that is your own affair. As for me, I say yes. And so on with all immorality, whatever can be thought of. Such a position is inadmissible. The same holds for religions. It is not correct to say that everyone can have the religion he wants. But in Dignitatis Humanae, the Declaration on Religious Liberty, the contrary is expressed. Recently, in getting ready for the visit of the Pope to Paris, Le Figaro devoted an entire page to Archbishop Lefebvre and his work. After a relatively accurate expose by John Bordarius on the society and its development, there were two other articles, one by Michael de Saint-Pierre and one by a priest. The one by Mr. Saint-Pierre was good, interesting, Essentially, it defended us, but the one by the priest was against us. Quote, Archbishop Lefebvre is against freedom of conscience, whereas he, the author, is for it, that is to say, for freedom of all religions, all opinions, and even all philosophies. Nothing is more irritating to the advocates of the freedom of all religions than the opposition we make basing ourselves upon the acts of the magisterium. And this is a very Masonic reaction. As soon as you attack them on this point, they react violently, and they accuse us of being intolerant. That is scarcely an argument. What happened at the Council was very serious, because it was effected by the penetration of liberal ideas within the Church. Presently at Rome, they do not know how to extricate themselves. The Catholic religion cannot exist in such an oppressive atmosphere. Truth cannot be mixed with error. Error is always against the truth and ends by devouring it, that is, by making it disappear. On the contrary, if they would affirm the truth once again with vigor, the errors would disappear. But without having recourse to the firm declaration of the truth, it is error that wins, at least apparently for a limited time, for ultimately only the truth will triumph. This is why it seemed important to me to carefully emphasize certain points by Gregory the Sixteenth in his encyclical Mirari Vos. <laughs> 